Now, let's have a look at uh, the inverse trig functions. So yesterday, we were looking at inverse functions in general. Let's see how we create the inverse trig ones. So inverse sine, which of course comes from our sine graph, which we'll draw quickly over here, because this is what we've got to invert. There it is. Now, the domain is all real x. The range is in between minus 1 and 1, but of course, it fails the horizontal line. So we want to grab a piece of the sine graph to get as much of the range as possible. And obviously there's lots of different sections we could take, uh, but I'd like to include zero. So the logical section to take is from uh, minus pi on 2 up to pi on 2. So that's going to be my restricted domain. So the range, I've got it all, that's, uh, that's good. So my new function, this inverse sine function, and again, as I mentioned yesterday, this is why we have the reciprocal ratios, um, so we don't confuse inverse sine with to the power of one, minus 1, because of course, in trig, we write our powers in that same spot. So minus 1 does not mean 1 over sine x, but our inverse sine function. Uh, its domain will be the old range, and its range will be the old, or the restricted, domain. Now this explains why when you go to your calculator, it'll only give you answers between minus 90 and 90, because your calculator works with functions. Alright, let's draw it in now. Unfortunately, because of the scale of my diagram here, uh, it's not the same on the y and the x-axis, of course, so I can't really do it on the same diagram, or it'll look rather strange, because uh, remember pi is about 3.14. And that's one on the y-axis scale. It's not quite even. So I'll just redraw it down here. There we go. Marking the important points. Minus one to one. Down to minus pi two. But basically it's a sine curve winding along the y-axis. But just a piece of it. And so we end up with that sort of shape. Again, it's not the cubic. So don't draw it like a cubic. It's a sine curve on its side. All right, let's have a look, see what happens with cosine. So our cosine graph is, of course, very similar, but it's been shifted left. I can't restrict the domain in the same way, however. So if I go from minus pi on 2 to pi on 2, it's still going to fail the, the horizontal line test. So for this one, we'll restrict it from 0 to pi. And then we get our complete range again. So we've captured everything. So when we invert it, the domain of our inverse cos, we've captured it all, so it's minus 1 to 1. But the range is 0 to pi, or 0 to 180 degrees. Again, explaining why with the cosine function, we didn't have that problem. Remember when we used the sine rule? We had a problem with obtuse angles, but the cosine rule we didn't. And this is why, because the inverse cosine function will give us answers that are uh, bigger than 90 degrees, okay? whereas the sine didn't. So, all right, let's draw this one in. And there's our cosine curve. Okay. Inverse tan. Well, it's a lot easier to spot how to trap it because, of course, it's made up of lots of different sections of the same shape. So, to get a complete range, I really just have to capture one of those sections between the asymptotes. So... My restricted domain, oh, just like the sine one for this one, I'll go between minus pi on 2 and pi on 2. And so my new function, the inverse tan function, domain will be all real x. Range will go from minus pi on 2 to pi on 2. So those vertical asymptotes become horizontal asymptotes. And I've got a tan curve on its side. So there are our three inverse trig graphs couple of features of inverse trig. If you look at the inverse sine graph, you'll notice it is an odd function. So therefore, inverse sine of minus x will be the minus of inverse sine x. Now, the cosine or inverse cos1, it doesn't have rotational symmetry and it doesn't have reflectional symmetry either. But what we have got is uh, an odd function that has been shifted, if you like. If we were to pull that inverse cos curve down pi on 2, 
then we would have the rotational symmetry that we require. And this is why we end up with pi minus. If it was an odd function, it would just be inverse cos of minus x is minus inverse cos x. But because of the shift of pi on 2, and that affects both of them, so here would be a minus pi on 2, there'd be a pi on 2 in here. So when we move it to the other side, we get two lots of pi on 2. And that's why we have pi minus inverse cos x. So it's an odd function that's been shifted up, pi on 2. Inverse tan was also an odd function, if you have a look at it. So inverse tan of minus x is minus the inverse tan of x. And another one, the inverse sine of x plus the inverse cos of x will always be pi on 2, or 90 degrees. Because basically, in a right-angled triangle, one angle will be the inverse sine of x, one will be the inverse cos of x. So they will always add up to be 90 degrees. So that comes from angle sum of a triangle. Okay, let's find the exact value. So, nice easy one, because these are our exact values that we know. So, root 3 is pi on 3, and inverse 10 on is pi on 4. And so our answer is pi on 12. It is wrong if you give the answer in degrees. Okay? The inverse 10 of root 3 is pi on 3. It is not 60. Okay? We're talking about numbers here. Yes, we apply it to measurements, but we're talking about a number. And this is really important, of course, when we come to integration and things like that, uh, because if we're talking about an area, there's a big difference between pi on 3 and 60. So the inverse tan of root 3 is pi on 3, minus the inverse tan of 1 is pi on 4, and so the exact value of this is pi on 12. Uh, again, these are exact values that we know. Uh, 1 on root 2, uh, minus a half. I could use the feature up here, the fact that it's an odd function, to rewrite that one, or I could look at my inverse sine graph and go, well, minus a half, oh, that's going to give me a, a negative acute angle as the answer. Either way, we'll get pi on 4 minus minus pi on 6, and that one's 5 pi on 12. Oh, okay, this is not an exact value. Inverse sine of 40 on 41. Remember, inverse trig, we are talking about an angle. So this is saying, what is the cosine of this angle? The inverse sine of 40 on 41. We do not need to find the angle, however. I can just draw up a triangle. If I just label one of those angles, inverse sine of 40 on 41 is an angle. So I'll, I'll say it's that one. Well, if the inverse sine is 40 on 41, it's telling me the sine of that angle is 40 on 41. A bit of Pythagoras, I can work out the third side. The cosine of that angle is 9 on 41. So we don't actually have to go and find the angle. And in some situations, if you did, it's probably going to be an approximation. And then if you go, depending on how good your calculator is, of course, if you go cosine of that, it may or may not come up with the exact answer. I think a lot of the new ones might, may well come up with the exact one because they are getting better, but it did or didn't work? Did someone try it? Did. Okay. However, in a test, oh, I, suppose, I suppose it depends on how many marks it's worth, isn't it? It's worth two. You're probably not going to get away with just punching it on a calculator. Now, inverse sine of the sine of pi, 5 pi and 6. The temptation is to say, I oh, will inverse sine cancel with sine, so the answer is 5 pi and 6. It seems logical. Except, inverse sine can only give answers between minus pi and 2 and pi and 2. That is its range. So it can't give you the answer 5 pi and 6. So, sine of 5 pi and 6... The answer is 5 pi on 6. Okay, think about it. 5 pi on 6, it's in the second quadrant. It's in the second quadrant. It's equivalent to the acute angle of pi on 6. And so that's why it comes back with the answer of pi on 6, not 5 pi on 6. So be very careful with that. If you're finding the inverse sine of some trig, you could only give answers out in its respective range. So for inverse sine and inverse tan, answer has to be between minus pi and 2 and pi and 2. For inverse cosine, the answer has to be between 0 and pi. Sine, 2 times the inverse cos of 3 fifths. Remember, inverse cos is an angle. This is just saying sine 2 theta. 
And so sometimes it's even convenient to say, oh, well, I'll just call it theta. And then I know I'm dealing with, well, there's theta. The inverse cos is three-fifths. Bit of Pythag, there's four. And so I'm saying sine two theta, well, that's two sine theta of cos theta. I can read off my triangle and come up with an answer, 24 and 25. The inverse cos of 2 cos pi on 3. Unfortunately, we don't have an inverse cos 2 theta or result. However, we do know what the cosine of pi on 3 is exactly. So we can work out this 2 times cosine pi on 3. So it's really asking me, what is the inverse cos of 1? Which is just zero. The tan of the inverse sine of 2 thirds plus the inverse cos of a quarter. Again, these are just angles. So this is like saying, what is the tan of alpha plus beta? Now, alpha and beta are in different triangles. Don't try and fit them into the same triangle. We're talking about two different angles here. So I'm going to call alpha inverse sine of two-thirds and put that in a triangle. There we go. And then I'll call beta inverse cos of a quarter. I'll put that in a triangle. So we've got adjacent over hypotenuse. All right. So now I can go tan plus tan on 1 minus tan tan. Read off my triangles. Substitute in. Tidy it up. And eventually, I didn't bother rationalizing the denominator. Uh, but uh, 2 plus 5 root 3 on root 5 minus 2 root 15 for that one. Okay. So let's play around with some inverse trig. One B.